Evening, everyone. My name is Miranda Dale. Can you all hear me? Okay. And I am the Visitor Operations Manager here at the Nantucket Historical Association. Tonight, we welcome two audiences, you here at the Whaling Museum and those virtually participating through Zoom all across the globe. And tonight's presentation falls on a very special evening. It is the one year anniversary of the NHA's affiliation with the Nantucket Lightship Basket Museum. And as we celebrate this iconic craft, we welcome Jack Fritch, our speaker, who will explore the history, mysteries, and myths of the Nantucket Lightship Basket. And um, as always, we will ask that you wait to answer um, or to ask any questions until the end of the presentation. If you're tuning in virtually, you can type in a question throughout the program in the Q&A section of Zoom. And to those in person here, we'll just wait till the end. Um, Jack Fritch first came to Nantucket as a research biologist in 1979. His love for history and antiques quickly led him to co-found the Antiques Depot in, in 1989 with the late Howard Chadwick. Jack is familiar to many as the former manager of the island's auction gallery for 23 years. His experience also includes participating in many highly respected antique shows, as well as providing his expertise to several premier New England auction galleries, nationally known museums and private collections, as well as being a personal property appraiser. He's written for the Nantucket Historical Association's Historic Nantucket, as well as Yesterday's Island. And he's a very active member in this community. He served as the former chair of the NHA's Festival of Trees. He's a perennial volunteer at this event. And he's served on many boards, including the Nantucket Book Foundation, the Nantucket Center for Elder Affairs, the Town Senior um, Center Committee, Musical Arts, the Nantucket Arts Council, the list goes on. So it's my pleasure this evening to welcome Jack Fritch. Thank you. And thank you all for, for coming and everyone out on Zoom land. Thank you for being here. A number of years ago, the Nantucket Lightship Basket Museum had invited me to give a talk uh, addressing a little volume. Or it could just be me. Um, the Nantucket Lightship Basket Museum, better? Um, not much. <laughs> It could just be me. Um, they asked me to examine, uh, discuss the confusion and misconceptions that have uh, persisted in the history of Nantucket baskets. Um, the talk seemed to be well received. They didn't escort me to the boat immediately afterwards. So it, it seemed to go over. Um, and that led to me being invited to talk about this again tonight. Um, the main problem is that there's a lot of, um, missteps, red herrings, um, there's untruths that have persisted in the history of Nantucket baskets. If you look at the few books written about them, chapters in books, magazine articles, lots of written online in blogs and on websites, there's just a lot of wrong information that has persisted. Uh, and there's really no reason for that at all. Um, to start with, people like to try to um, suggest that the Nantucket basket was created by the Na Native Americans on Nantucket. It's a direct descendant of the, the Native American baskets, which really just is not true. Native Americans made terrific baskets of a number of different sorts. None of them look anything at all like a Nantucket basket. Uh, on the screen are the most typical Northeastern Indian baskets, splint baskets, um, pretty unique to the Northeast. This is what most of the baskets are like. They don't have proper rigid staves, they don't have wooden bottoms. There is really no relation to, um, to our Nantucket basket. Even this more, more stave-like structure, still soft bottom, nothing to do with our baskets. The um, other variations are sweet grass baskets that are, are twined. But again, you can clearly see from these that um, these are nothing at all like Nantucket baskets. I've, two Indian baskets here that I'll pass around that people can look at. Um, it, there just is not that connection. Late in the, um, in the period of the, the Wampanoag, still an island, Abram Quarry, the um, self-professed last Nantucket Indian made baskets. And here's one of his. 
even here on Nantucket, it's still um, woven bottom, has none of the structure, none of the details of what makes a Nantucket basket a Nantucket basket. Um, the other prevailing myth is um, they started on the whale ships, that the Nantucket whalers whiling away time at sea made baskets and this then moved on to the light ships. And there's just simply no evidence for that at all. We know a lot about what whalers did on board the whale ships. There's extensive records left. They described it in their log books and journals. The pieces and collections were passed down in family. This is what the whalers made upon, on whale ships. Um, other sailor folk art comes in many forms, looks like this, but none of it has anything to do with Nantucket baskets. There's not a single Nantucket basket known to have made aboard a whale ship. There was um, a little bit of anecdotal um, rumor that Captain Thomas James, who was originally a whaleman, um, made baskets prior to the light ships. We know he made some on land here before serving aboard the light ships. Uh, it's said that David Woods perhaps said that he had once heard someone say that Captain James made some on board a whale ship. Um, there's no evidence. I don't think there's even evidence that David said that. Um, but there's certainly no evidence that Thomas James did that. The sealers also said that same thing in their book, Nantucket Lightship Baskets, though unfortunately that book is, is quite discredited um, and not to be relied upon. Um, the other idea is that um, the, the, the crafts and skills that the whalers had developed on board ship is what led to the basket making, in particular coopers making barrels and barrel staves. Since Nantucket baskets have staves, they thought, well, it must come from the coopers. Um, there's coopers all over the world. They're throughout farming districts. They're everywhere. And baskets are everywhere, but those two did not result in a Nantucket basket anywhere else other than on Nantucket. The, um, the coopers, the, the whole whale ship idea just doesn't really um, hold water um, when examined. There is, however, another basket with a strong Nantucket connection, the New Hampshire work basket. New Hampshire was um, pretty intimately connected to Nantucket in the 17th century. We were owned by New York, but culturally, economically, uh, we're really pretty close to being a part of New Hampshire. Um, Tristan Coffin's son, Peter, lived and owned most of Dover, New Hampshire which in the 17th century was much more than just present day Dover. It included all of Portsmouth outside of the Strawberry Banks, the entire seacoast and extended about 200 miles inland, all dense forest owned by the Coffin family. Um, he did move back to Nantucket, but then left in 1670 and stayed permanently in New Hampshire till he died in 1715. They had a, a monopoly on Nantucket. You could not bring lumber, logs, trees, any wood product to Nantucket. You had to buy it from the Coffin family from their private forest in New Hampshire. So the, the cultural properties of New Hampshire were coming back and forth quite readily, including the New Hampshire work basket, which for the first time we see characteristics that have become um, integral, uh, definitive of the Nantucket basket. Um, in the slide, you can see solid wooden staves, a wooden rim. Um, the wooden rim is split. You can see a little bit here where the staves are coming up between that rim and being received. The bottom as well. This luckily actually happens to be broken. You can see on the slide, it's a solid wooden bottom plate that's split to receive the staves going right down into that bottom, characteristic of how an Nantucket basket is made. And one too far, this, the rim the same. You have a solid wooden rim split in half to receive the staves going right up in the middle. No other basket that we know of is made that way. Not to conics, not shakers, nothing the Native Americans made. These are the characteristics that make the Nantucket basket, basket so distinct. Um, the difference with the New Hampshire basket is it's made from wooden splints, probably ash. Um, on Nantucket, we didn't have those trees. Lumber was pretty, um, was too valuable. Any scrap of wood too valuable to shave up into little basket splints. 
but from the China trade, cane was arriving here. Um, the, the first raffia, the, the peanuts and popcorn of the day for packing um, fragile valuable items like Chinese porcelain. And the cane that came from the Philippines, which back in the 19th century got nicknamed Nantucket cane, was this phenomenal um, growth, perfect for weaving baskets. Normal cane grows about 15 inches or so between nodes, that round hard part you see on a long piece of grass. You can't weave with that node. Uh, Nantucket cane is this jungle vine that grows about 12, 15 feet perhaps between nodes. So it's perfect for weaving. It came here as junk, the peanuts and popcorn packing material that they saw was perfect for making, um, making baskets. So they took that Nantucket, that New Hampshire basket uh, and adapted with cane. That's now the, the essence of a Nantucket basket. Um, you can run that one out if you like. Thanks. Um, I mentioned that, that they were made on land, but barely. Um, I don't know if any have survived. They certainly were not made in great number on land until um, we don't get a proliferation of this until the light ship period. Uh, the first light ship was commissioned by Congress in 1819, built in 1820. Not long after that, 1849 was the first time one appeared in Nantucket waters. So very early on in the light ship period, we got a light ship, 1849. In the 1850s, early 1850s, we start seeing these baskets being made on board the light ships and becoming quite well known for it. Um, captain Thomas James was uh, captain of the South Shoals light ship. And we know he started making them on board that light ship, taught other people, it quickly spread. Uh, South Shoals and Cross Rip especially, um, it seemed, we, you hear that famous quote about all hands aboard scrim shanding. It seemed that those two light ships, all hands aboard, were making baskets after a very short while. Um, it made perfect sense. A light ship is just permanently anchored there. This isn't, a, um, I should have mentioned, it, an example of a wooden light ship as it would have appeared in the 1850s. It's really just a wooden hulled vessel with the rigging cut down to support just the two major lights. Um, our Nantucket. South Shoal of the same form, that's a sailing ship, but being anchored there. It's not sailing anywhere, it's just anchored. So the sailors have very little to do. Um, keep it clean, keep the brass polished, and keep the lights burning, those two magnificent beacons. They served, I think, about three weeks on, and it was just a few days off. So a lot of time out there just anchored with nothing to do beyond that minimum. So weaving a basket was a brilliant idea. Occupy time. They weren't paid very well, so what they made, they could bring ashore and sell, make a, a tremendous addition to their income. This worked very well until 19, about 1916, when um, the Department of Transportation that was paying their salary realized that they're paying them a wage and they're setting out there on company time, making things for themselves and selling them, and they put an end to it. Um, so no more light ship baskets. Um, when people hear that at my shop, there's usually a comment about, well, isn't that just typical, the government stepping in. Um, but when you remember that two, or I think three Nantucket light ships got run down by ships on station, that it's probably a good idea that they weren't making baskets, they were paying attention and staying alive out there in these dangerous waters. Um, once you stopped making them on board ship, once it moved to land again, technically that would be the end of the light ship period. Um, after that, they should probably be called Nantucket baskets as opposed to Nantucket lightship baskets. Um, there was a direct connection from the ships um, in many ways. For instance, um, William Appleton, who served aboard the South Shoal lightship, taught A.D. Williams how to make a basket. This is a, a lovely A.D. Williams. Between Appleton and Williams, they pretty much invented the, um, the oval form, which is much more difficult to make than the, the round. This is actually signed by Williams. Um, Williams then taught Ferdinand Silvaro, who lived on Orange Street, never served aboard a ship. Silvaro taught other people. Um, you've got that direct line. This is a, um, uh, an early Appleton and another early Appleton. Um, Charles Ray, who also served aboard the ship, one of the earliest of makers, um, this is the only example of one of his baskets I could find. 
he taught his grandson, Michi Ray, who is very important. He was weaving up into the 40s. He taught a huge number of people. Um, Frederick Chadwick, who uh, ended up, I think, teaching Bill Severns. Um, but Michi also taught Jose Reyes how to make a basket. Um, obviously hugely important. Jose came here just after World War II, had traditionally made, made Nantuck, um, traditionally made Filipino baskets. Michi taught him how to make the Nantucket basket. And after a very brief period of time, he had the idea, or he's, he's credited with the idea of um, putting a lid on it, a swing handle and turning it into a woman's purse, which is then taken off and that's the rest is history as they say. Uh, unfortunately, history isn't quite that clear because while Reyes did that, um, you have other people that had already done that. This is a Michi Ray with cover, with swing handle. It's the same form done before Reyes. Um, this is another one by um, A.D. Williams, who, um, same thing, it really is the purse. So Reyes didn't really invent it like we always say he did, um, but he took their idea and, and marketed it. He was a brilliant marketer. He took the pre-existing form, streamlined it, made it much more convenient as a purse. Um, and this is a race, yeah. Um, and that's what really caught on. He started making them about 1948, 49. Uh, Stephen Gibbs, Sherwin Boyer, then by the early 50s, 53 and on, John Kitlet, and then it just, it went on. So that's kind of the, uh, there's the history in a nutshell and the origins um, to pull it all together and examine to, to really define then what is and is not an Nantucket basket. Um, some of the criteria said that it, well, it needs to be made on Nantucket. That's really not a tenable field. If you have a field guide to identifying an Nantucket basket, that doesn't work. Unless it's signed, you don't know where it came from. You, you, you don't know if it was made here or not. Um, many of um, of the, the really classic makers, Harry Hilbert, a famous and considered a, a phenomenal basket maker. He's from Princeton, New Jersey. He never lived here at all. Uh, this is an example of one of his, of his I think I'm fading out again. Um, he jokingly referred to his baskets as non-tucket since he didn't live here, but it, it's an Nantucket basket, but clearly was not made here. Um, this is another example of his. Uh, Alan Reed, uh, by everyone's accounts, one of the finest makers alive today, um, started making them here in the, the late 70s. As I said, highly respected, he has moved off island. He lives over in Yarmouth now, and he does still make baskets. If, if using this has to be made on Nantucket criteria, the exact same basket, the same mold, same material, same design, well, yesterday was an Nantucket basket, but the one he made today is not. You can see the nonsense of, of this. Um, other criteria is they have a solid wooden bottom and rim split to receive staves. That's true. That's we see in every basket and that holds up. Um, you, you've got that, that solid wooden stave, um, the rims inserting through it and the same with the bottom. Um, Another criteria that is often used is it has to be woven on a mold. There's a great shot of a basket being made on a mold. Um, unfortunately, um, here's one, an example of Jose Reyes, early baskets not made on a mold at all. It's a freeform basket. Uh, we know some of the ones coming off the light ships were freeform. So they're not always made on a mold at all. So that, that criteria doesn't, doesn't stick in there but most are made on molds. So we, we can keep it in as usually on a mold, but not definitively. If you haven't seen basket molds before up close, it's just a simple turned wooden um, block that the basket is fastened down onto, the staves bent around and fastened and then woven. Um, these three molds um, are 
pretty important molds. These um, came from Jose Reyes. Do you want to give this to you? Um, sure. Um, they were presents to him for Michi Ray when Mitchie was teaching him and getting him started off. And Mitchie explained to him that he didn't make them either. These were gifts from his grandfather, Charles Ray, out on the light ships. And after Jose, he gave them to his, uh, his son-in-law, who's just recently passed away, uh, but continued making baskets after Jose. So you've got the entire history of Nantucket baskets from the very start to the present, all in these few molds, which is, Pretty exciting, makes the, the hair stands up here. <laughs> Thinking about that one. Um, rattan staves is another criteria, doesn't work. Um, Gibbs, a lot of the um, a lot of the best baskets, that's the Allen again. Um, a lot of the best baskets uh, used oak staves. Um, so I would suggest a rigid stave, not, um, not rattan necessarily at all. Um, cane weavers, the actual weaving then, as we saw we, in the New Hampshire basket, the wooden splints were replaced with a cane wrap. That would seem to be a pretty good one to stick with, except here's a, a very early basket from Captain Thomas James where it's woven with palm fiber. So I've seen other ones that used some baleen for, for weavers, so it's not necessarily always always an only cane, has to stay kind of loose. Um, I think it's very important with Nantucket baskets in general that it has to stay somewhat loose because there are a lot of exceptions. Oddballs, it's not just palm weaves. This is a, a basket by Jose Reyes, a church offering basket. Um, with a handle like that and a structure, that doesn't fit anyone's definition of what a Nantucket basket would look like, but it most certainly clearly is. Um, Another one, you'd never see a rim like that generally. Uh, it's an alms basket, another money collecting basket uh, made on Nantucket. It's an Nantucket basket that does not fit the normal concept. This is an even more bizarre version of something like that to pass around a basket. Made on Nantucket, but not by a normal uh, definition. Um, that was an illustration of stays. The, amongst the oddest of, uh, of the Nantucket baskets were ones you're getting into something like this. This was called the lollipop basket because the staves don't end at the top, it extend right past that rim and got carved off. Typically round, this one's slightly heart-shaped. This is actually a pretty important basket. It's the world record price setter for a basket. This sold for 115,000 uh, when it came up for auction. A number of other of these, this form has shown up over the years, um, but there's another, even more bizarre, which I dubbed the double lollipop because it has not only the round end to the finial, but the second cutout round, that second lollipop in there. I've now seen three of these. We have no idea who made them. The first one I saw um, came out of a closet here on Island. They bought it from an antique shop, very old at its time uh, in 1971. So it was quite old at that time. Um, I have found, as I said, two others, including this one. Um, and just as I was preparing these notes, I found a photograph of what would have to be a triple lollipop. Instead of one, there's actually two complete round cutouts through the stave. Um, so amongst the most bizarre and rare of all the oddball um, versions of an Antarctic basket. So where that ends it up with, with is for a good working definition, has to be discernible. You can't use an ephemeral, ephemeral uh, idea um, or ethereal idea. Like it, it has to be made in a certain place because there's no way to prove that. It has to be um, a good working provable definition, have to be based on form. Um, I would suggest that a Nantucket basket is a basket with a solid wooden bottom plate and solid rim split to receive rigid staves uh, with typically cane weavers and usually made on a mold. And I would stop it at that. And at that point, I welcome questions or complaints, arguments. Yes, so um, now we are ready for our Q&A period. Um, I'm waiting for those 
to ask questions virtually, but anyone here in the audience have questions for Jack? There's a microphone here going around. I, I thought, no, I most, thought light ship baskets were always made. Of most water. people do kind of think that. Um, and it's, it's said online constantly, and you go to different websites, magazines, it's always described that way, um, but not so. When I first started um, in antiques, quite frequently baskets would come through the auctions or other dealers, um, other basket makers would talk about, oh, that's a freeform one. Uh, Reyes in particular made quite a few freeform ones that we would look for and you'd recognize because they wouldn't keep a uniform shape. Um, if it's on a mold, it's nice, neat, tidy, uniform. Um, you're going to weave at a constant tension. Without that mold to keep that on, you can expand and contract as you're weaving. So you get, um, in the furniture, would be called Bombay. Uh, you have a, 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 like a pot belly shape to these things. It can, it can start out fat and get narrower as you tighten. Without a mold, you can get some pretty weird shapes. You'll often get a tendency to warp in a basket that wasn't made with a mold. Um, so usually, typically, but not always. And that used to be more be better known than it is today, for some reason. What are the, so, best, what are the best sources uh, to identify and find and purchase uh, either light chip or special baskets? Um, you're in the right place <laughs> on Nantucket. Um, I used to make jokes as an antiques dealer here that if you didn't have Nantucket baskets, they, they threw you off island. They wouldn't let you stay here. Um, so most antique shops here would certainly have baskets. The Nantucket auctions, um, New England regional auctions will also, you'll, you'll see baskets turning up in New Hampshire, Maine, um, on Cape Cod certainly. Uh, for many, many years, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, Generally, the best prices were achieved at auctions off island. People seemed to pay more for them there than they would here, which made no sense to us, but it, it was a given. It was, we always knew that um, if the basket went to New Hampshire, it was going to bring a lot more money than if it went up for auction here. Um, I don't think that's true anymore. I think it, the market has leveled out, but it would, most of these will be inside New England, shops, auctions, antique shows. Um, they occasionally turn up even on places like I hear about them on eBay. Um, Alan Reed called me once years ago, all excited. Um, someone put up a basket on eBay um, and he found it within minutes of it appearing there. And it was available for buy it now for $40. And he called me and said, I just bought a Jose Reyes for $40. Um, it's, it doesn't happen often. Um, Generally, you would go to um, auctions, shops, and antique shows where people that are carrying them know something about them so that you can have some um, uh, confidence that you're getting something correct. It's properly identified. There's a lot of um, fake Nantucket baskets, a lot of ones made in China, um, Korea, machine made, untouched by human hands, sort of. Um, you'd want to be able to tell the difference of those. And so dealing with someone that you can rely upon would be good. But there's, there's many people carrying them. Someone um, virtually asking, would you talk a little bit about the history of the nest? History of the nests. Um, it used to be believed, is generally believed that nests are an aftermarket effect um, that people didn't make and sell nests at the time. Um, if um, Roland Folger made a five inch or seven inch and a nine inch round basket and sold them, if you bought three of those, you can put them together and have a nice graduated nest. Um, I'm not confident of that. Some of them are just so perfectly matched, so perfectly graduated, um, not just in the size of the basket itself, but their handles will all fit neatly right inside each other, the same shape, but perfectly graduated. Some of them just seem like they had to have been tweaked and deliberately made to live together as that nest. Um, in more contemporary times, um, you know, we're getting away from the light ship period and that early land period, uh, but in the 70s, 80s, many, many people would make um, baskets deliberately as nests. 
threes, fives. Um, there's someone that specialized in nested 12. I can't imagine that much patience <laughs> to read 12 and graduate them all. That's a great question. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, when uh, we're best, the, the purse is first decorated with scrimshaw um, or some decoration on the top. Uh, when Jose Reyes made his first baskets, they had a plain top. Um, so he quickly graduated from pine to a, a nicer looking wood. Um, and oh, I've had 12 different people claim that they were the ones who told him, go talk to Charlie Sale. Um, but whoever's responsible for it, Jose did go to Charlie Sale, uh, a very, uh, very well known at the time, uh, Nantucket craftsman, a fisherman who was extremely talented and scrim shanded, made ship models, half hulls. He was an all around um, great folk artist. Went to him, said, what do you think? What, what could look good on here? And he made a, um, a sperm whale out of, um, it's out walking around somewhere, out of ebony, a little ebony sperm whale to go on top of the basket. And people loved it. And a couple of years later, uh, he thought, well, that was good. Why not make carving out of a whale tooth? So he did that and it was even more popular. He eventually did the whale, um, a gull in flight and a map of the island. And there's our, our sperm whale on an early race. Um, and a map of that, it was just those three and all purses had one of those three things. Uh, I'm not sure when things really um, kind of exploded into whatever you wanted to do on them. But certainly by the late 70s, you were getting all sorts of carving, scallop shells, um, found objects uh, like antique net skis would appear and anything that you wanted on your basket top, you could have put on your basket top. But it started with Reyes and Charlie Sale probably around 1952 or so or three, early 50s he probably did his first. We have a question um, from Mary virtually asking, are there modern baskets, which are obviously inspired by the Nantucket basket, but you would consider them as having gone far past the definition of a Nantucket light chip basket, um, such as using plastic weavers? Another great question. Um, I know people that were weaving out here in the 70s and 80s that would use plastic uh, as a joke. They were kind of, um, thumbing their nose at the lofty tradition of the Nantucket basket. Um, they'd cut up Frisbees and use that hard plastic to weave with, just kind of as a joke. Um, I don't know of other materials besides you know, baleen that often got incorporated, whalebone in the staves, but I think the best example of something really departing and getting really far out from the norm would be ones made right here on island. Uh, Michael Kane especially made um, very non-basket, non-Nantucket baskets, um, till-top tea tables, um, multi-tiered like muffin stands. He made furniture, um, he wove furniture. Um, other people have done that as well, but that would, in my mind, that would be about as far, far astray, far um, delightfully crazy that you could get with departing from the normal rigid idea of the Nantucket basket. We have another question from Anne. Um, what is the future of Nantucket baskets? Who is teaching the art and are teachers always American or has the skill transitioned internationally? It has indeed gone international. Um, another very good question. Most of us are pretty worried about the history of, of the future because on island, um, it's, it's getting, basket weavers are getting pretty thin on the ground. Um, around 1980, there was, as I recall, about 30, 32 people making a living, full-time living, weaving baskets on Nantucket. And um, today it might be eight, somewhere around there. Um, new young folk aren't taking up the trade. They're not interested, taking up the craft, the skill. Um, so it's a little scary. Um, I see that the, the NHA has a great course coming up this summer on basket weaving. I think that's extremely important. We need a lot more of that to push to get people to continue weaving here. But um, 
going internationally, um, at the, at the, right now, the future is in Japan. Um, one lady in particular who came and studied with Alan Reed um, and Nap Plank started making baskets. And um, she has a society of basket makers in Tokyo with 1,500 members. She's a shop there that teaches classes and sells baskets. Another one here in um, Cambridge, Mass. We're um, going strong, teaching, teaching the craft. And um, it turns out that um, with a name like Fritsch, I often make jokes about Germans being so meticulous about things. Uh, the Japanese are even more so. They are perfectionists. They, they weave a, just an amazing, superb quality basket that's just so precise, so neat, so tight. Um, when they come here, it took a long time for them to get used to, ant to antique baskets because antiques aren't perfect and precise. They're worn, there's breaks, there's stains, and they would just you know, back off from those. Um, they've eventually come to appreciate that that's, that's the, the life and love in that basket is in all those little imperfections. So they've come to love the antiques as well. But the, the future is in good hands in, in terms of um, the quality of craftsmanship moving forward right now. There's a, a huge amount of people making them, but um, unfortunately for Nantucket, it's mostly in Japan. Um, but it, I think it'll grow here again. And we have um, a handful of questions about miniature baskets. When did they start? Who started them? Just a little history, if you. Another great question. I haven't thought of that before. Um, I would think that the, the, the so-called one egg and two egg baskets um, would have been the first miniatures. Um, they're not really miniature, they're just petite. Um, they didn't actually, weren't made to hold eggs, but you're looking at it and it would be about the size that you could hold a single egg and twice that size. We call them a double egg basket. Um, they go back into the 19th century. We've seen some that clearly were made aboard the light ships. So it is a long tradition. In more recent times, they've gotten truly miniature. Um, not just the jewelry, um, most of which are actually cast, not woven. Some uh, Diane Kim England used to actually hand weave with golden wire or thread. She, she was probably we, properly weaving an Nantucket basket, but out of gold. Um, but other miniatures are straight Nantucket baskets with the, the little the staves, the wooden base, the split rim. Um, Nap Plank is probably best known for that. He's um, uh, he's my best friend. He's almost like a brother. So I can say he's clearly insane. He'll make um, like a nest of three baskets where the smallest one will just barely fit onto my little finger. And unlike other small baskets where it's, it's they're clunky, they're small, but kind of clunkily built, his are properly shrunk down. It's made just like a full size, an adult basket. Um, the staves are all tapered and even, and, graduated to go around the oval. I mean, they are made exactly like a full-size basket, but just down in this incredibly tiny, tiny little dimensions. And the current demand for light ship baskets, we've had a few questions. And it, curious, it's a, a, the answer is curious. Um, a lot of dealers and auction houses tell me that, um, that the market's gone. Um, uh, some of the basket makers were telling me that the demand's no longer there, people aren't interested. And I don't see that at all myself. Um, uh, the demand seems as high or higher than ever um, from my perspective. Um, they, they, they move and disappear quicker than I can find them. Um, uh, the demand's great. People fully appreciate, um, I mean, it bridges many, many genre of collecting interest. It's a folk art. So people that collect baskets, people that collect general folk art, people that collect uh, marine items, ship-related items, because uh, it is a sailor's folk art uh, at its start, um, and people that collect Nantucket. I mean, you've got all these various, and I'm sure there's many other genre that, that are not occurring to me that would all have a um, appeal in, in the Nantucket basket. I, Purse collectors, 
Absolutely, which is a very huge press conference. That's an interesting, uh, makes me think of something else that hasn't been asked yet. Um, the value, the prices, the value of basket. And when you first meet a good purse, um, you know, a race and you see 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, Eight thousand dollars on a purse, uh, on a basket. You're thinking that seems crazy. How do you justify that? And um, it was a purse collector that pointed that out to me that this is a handmade, handcrafted item made one at a time by a unique artist who is no longer alive, who could only make so many. Uh, Reyes was very prolific, but others not nearly so prolific. In contrast, a purse never touched by human hands. Uh, fabric that's printed by a machine, the whole thing's assembled and made by a machine, and then a label made by a machine that says Hermes or Gucci or whoever, and that can be $8,000, $10,000, $14,000. So in contrast, for high-end purses, these are a bargain um, when you look, when looked at it in, in that perspective. And what began um, your love for the basket? Just wants to know about your passion. Um, well, being on Nantucket, loving Nantucket history, uh, getting involved in antiques on Nantucket, um, you can't help but fall in love with them. Uh, they're indigenous to here. They're unique amongst baskets in the world. They're, you don't find these anywhere else but from these baskets originated here. Um, also for years where one of my best friends, Nappy, was weaving them. And so for those first many years, I had to make, of course, basket weaving jokes. <laughs> so what are you doing, college? Take a basket weaving? Um, so I had to pay penance for that and get serious about them and, and learn about them. Uh, but it, it's, it's so easy to fall in love with them. They're, um, they're organic, they're warm. Um, the, the surface, the, everything about them, it does really grow on you. And like everything, the more you learn about something, the more you start to appreciate them. And you start seeing the different makers and how um, an, an Appleton is different than a, a, a Michi Ray. You start to recognize the individual handprints on these fingerprints of, um, of their styles. That reminds me of something that I should have mentioned earlier. I don't have a round one here. Um, one of the other myths that used to persist with baskets was you could identify who made it by the concentric rings in the bottom plate. You look into a basket, some are plain, but some might have two concentric rings, three, seven. Um, and the sealers in particular in their book pushed the theory that that would be indicative of, uh, of who made the basket. You could identify the maker by that, um, which is a, a, a lovely idea. Unfortunately, there was no facts to back it up. Um, during the lightship period, there were two wood lathes on island, none of which were owned by a basket maker. So all the basket makers were buying their, those turn bottom plates with those lathe turn lines from two individuals. So maybe it could indicate which carpenter they bought their bottom plate from. Um, I think it was more just, it's kind of a random, you can't tie that into an individual maker. Could you discuss the difference between wooden or metal handle attachments? Yes. Um, the earliest baskets, um, the handles were attached to uh, wooden staves that go all the way down. I almost brought one with me. Um, the stave goes right to the bottom. It, it is a full proper stave. Um, that got shortened where there would be a, a wooden insert caught secured in the weaving. Um, fairly long with time as you get later in the 19th century, uh, it gets shorter and shorter and it overlaps where around 1870 or so, you'll still see wooden ones, but you'll start to also see metal ones, um, usually tin, sometimes copper. Um, I think I've seen brass occasions, but you wouldn't tend to have brass plate often. Um, triangular shaping is caught right down there, goes through the rim like a stave, but resting up against the stave and just tightly connected with the weave of the cane and the, the handle of the basket will be attached to that. So first wood, later metal, um, and a tendency from long all the way to the bottom to get shorter and shorter as time went on. 
And another question um, from Jane, has anyone tried to replicate the lollipop basket more recently? Um, yeah, um, I had a, if I can, I lost my clicker. Um, there was, actually the slideshow was ended for me. I did show one by Harry Hilbert, um, who was working in the eighties and nineties, who, um, I had never known he had done one, but he, he did a, a full lollipop end to his staves. Um, I would imagine there's people out there that have to be since one sold for 115,000. Um, that would definitely prompt someone to, um, it's all right. Uh, but none that I know of um, other than examples like Harry Hilbert. Then Sounds like that might be it. time for oh Mary right here. Yes. No, but my wife has. <laughs> Jack, I have to ask again: Have you ever made a basket? Uh, and my answer was: I uh, shamefully have not. Um, I should. Well, I think we should. I know that. the very one that I would like to make, um, but um, with Nappy's instructions, help. And guidance. My wife did make a lovely um, open oval swing handle basket that she gave to her mom as a Christmas present, and it still uh, it still looks lovely in their front parlor in Cork, Ireland. Do you want to make one? <laughs> um, th there's it's it's not quite a miniature. It's a small basket that Nappy makes. Um, it's probably three inch round. Uh, inch and a half high, broad, shallow um, staves that come up. The first one I saw like that, that he made, he had whalebone staves. Um, I also thought that was just so gorgeous, such a, a beautiful, simple, it's almost soap dish sized. You know, it's not something huge, but it's just such a graceful, uh, lightful form that, yeah, I, I would like to make a basket someday, along with making a decoy, scrim a tooth, uh, building a boat. Um, so I'll probably never get around to any of those, but yeah, someday I would. Between Nappy and you, one of you's got to teach me. <laughs> a few things. <laughs> um, also, did you hear the story about the shipwreck that had the uh, load of ebony wood on? And that's what Charlie Sales made his ebony whales out of. No, how cool. Do we know? Yeah, I know it all ship? came ashore, a lot of it on Tuckanut. I don't know much more than that, but I know that that story was going around. Which makes perfect sense. Um, everything was saved and recycled out here. Um, there's a lot of houses you go into and you'll see parts of shipwrecks in their structure. They go into the basement and it's a, a ship's knees holding a part of the floor. So a, a lovely cargo like that coming ashore was not gonna go to waste. It would end up in the hands of someone who could well use the ebony or you know, whatever else is coming up. I also know Bill and Judy Sale. They said that uh, Millie um, Millicent, no, what is her name? Um, Millie Jewett. Oh, no, no, I no, no. Um, Different Millie. Mrs. Sale asked um, her hu husband to make, have Jose Reyes make a basket so that, and Charlie make the whale for it. So you have to firm that one up with them because I know they've told us that many a time. Okay. That's all my history for you. <laughs> Every little bit is great. Um, it, it's so intimately tied into, into Nantucket um, and, and Nantucket people. Uh, when I was first working at the auctions, um, I worked with uh, an, an elderly woman who was an absolute delight. And tourists would come in the summer and ask her about Nantucket baskets and said, well, you must all use them. And she said, I wouldn't be caught dead with one of those. They're clunky. They're, they're not comfortable. I wouldn't be caught dead carrying one of those. Um, at the time, Jose Reyes was selling for about $400. And a few years later, they had gotten to $1,200, $1,500, $1,800. $1, day I noticed as a tourist came in and asked her, so do you, uh, all you ladies must carry these. And she reached down and pulled up hers. Oh, of course, I would never leave home without it. So they really are, but they're, they're a part of us. They're a part of the, the fiber. 
thank you very, very much for coming. And thank you for attending on Zoom. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jack. That was fascinating. I fell in love with those um, miniature baskets this summer at the Hadwin House. So, um, so many details you can find new, new ones each day. Um, and thank you to our members for making these programs possible. And we hope that you join us next Tuesday, April 5th. We welcome Caroline Collados from the Nantucket Land Council, who will talk about sand sandbar sharks are misunderstood summer visitors. And have a great evening. Thank you.